a story. At the beginning of time, God's presence filled the universe. When God decided to bring this world into being in order to make room for creation, God first drew in God's breath and contracted God's self. From that contraction, darkness was created. And when God said, let there be light, the light that came into being filled the darkness and ten holy vessels came forth, each filled with primordial light. In this way, God sent forth those ten vessels like a fleet of ships, each carrying its cargo of light. Had they, had they arrived intact, the world would have been perfect. But the vessels were too fragile to contain such a powerful divine light. They broke open, split asunder, and all the holy sparks were scattered like sand, like seeds, like stars. Those sparks fell everywhere. That is why we were created, to gather the sparks, no matter where they are hidden. God created the world so that descendants of Yaakov could raise up the holy sparks. That is why there has been so many exiles, to release the holy sparks from the servitude of captivity. In this way, the Jewish people will sift all the holy sparks from the four corners of the earth. And when enough holy sparks have been gathered, the broken vessels will be restored and tikkun olam, the repair of the world, awaited so long, will finally be complete. Therefore, it should be the aim of everyone to raise these sparks from wherever they are imprisoned and to elevate them to holiness by the power of their soul. This is a retelling of the breaking of the vessels and the gathering of the sparks, one of the last great sacred myths to enter Judaism. It is the te teaching of Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, who lived in the 16th century and is renowned as the greatest Kabbalist of modern times, perhaps of all times. We are acutely, acutely aware that the world is broken. A day doesn't go by without us getting another reminder and we feel the brokenness in our heart and the brokenness of our heart. This Kabbalistic myth establishes that brokenness is inherent to the world from its inception. It is part of the fabric of creation well before humanity came into being. Shattering is at the heart of reality and of human life. No one is immune from it, no one escapes it. We all live with multiple fractures all around us and inside us. The shards of the original vessels and the sparks of the primordial light are all around us. The main task of our lives is to find and gather the sparks so the vessels can be restored and become whole again. That is called the work of tikkun, the healing and repair of the world. But because we are human and we struggle with our imperfection, most of us do some repair and much more breaking. And so we come on this night of Kol Nidre holding the broken pieces of our lives. We go into the hollow and dark spaces we allow ourselves to feel the embarrassment, the sadness, and the regret. We try to muster the courage to hold ourselves accountable and to take responsibility for our part in the shattering. For shattering promises and commitments, for shattering loyalty, for shattering relationships, for shattering truth, for shattering love, 
for shattering justice, for shattering peace, for shattering dreams, and for having participated in shattering the world. Even as we sit in the brokenness, there's great relief in these 25 hours of Yom Kippur, a feeling of liberation that we don't have to hide. We don't have to hold it together and pretend we are whole because we are not whole. We are broken. There isn't one of us who does not feel broken by our flaws, our shortcomings, all our transgressions, all our wrongdoing, our bitterness, our sin, our shame, the missed opportunities, the loss. It is liberating to be able to acknowledge, to acknowledge that, and to dwell on this day of Yom Kippur in that profound truth, that we are all broken, and we don't have to pretend that we are whole. Not surprisingly, the origin of Yom Kippur lies in a story about brokenness. Here is the story. God gave Moshe the tablets bearing the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai on Shavuot. Forty days later, seeing that Moshe had failed to come down from the mountain, the people forced Aaron to make the golden calf. When Moshe came down and saw the people dancing around the calf, he smashed the tablets. After another 40 days on the new moon of Elul, Moshe went back up to the mountain for an additional 40 days and pleaded with God to forgive their sin. Finally, on the 10th of Tishrei, God granted forgiveness and gave Moshe a new set of tablets. On that very day, Moshe came down with the second tablets. That day was Yom Kippur. So this day, the holiest day in, in our calendar, commemorates the repair of the relationship between God and the people after it breaks, the restoration of wholeness and the new beginning, all signified by a new set of tablets. Let's go back to the moment when Moshe smashed the first tablets. Moshe is the towering figure of our tradition, the liberator, the indefatigable leader, the man of God. He did many great things in his life. According to Rashi, of all his deeds, the breaking of the first tablets is the most momentous and significant in all of Moshe's life. He smashes the concrete symbol of revelation and of God's covenant with Israel, the tablets fashioned by God and inscribed by God's finger. And how does God react? When Moshe breaks the tablets, Moshe earns God's unequivocal approval. God told him with a play on words, the tablets which you broke, haluchot asher shibarta, ishar kochacha sheshibarta. Congratulations that you broke them. Really? Yashar koach? Congratulations for breaking them? It's absolutely stunning that God would commend Moshe. How come? Aviva Zornberg introduces a Talmudic paradox. If the tablets had not been shattered, the Torah would not have been forgotten in Israel. And she offers a profound insight. Breaking the tablet symbolizes the undoing of memory, the lugubrious hazard of obli ob oblivion. Moshe introduces the phenomenon of rapture, of forgetting into the tradition. If the Torah is forgotten, the effect is not, after all, unmitigatedly tragic. For out of oblivion comes interpretation, reconstruction, the act of memory that recreates the past. Sometimes it is the rapture that opens the door to deeper understanding and new insights, to imagination and creativity. When we sit in the breach, in the not knowing, among the fragments, in the chaos and the confusion, it is precisely there that the opportunity arises for us to search, to recreate, to rebuild. The Hasidic master Rabbi Meir Simchaus Dvinsk 
known as the Meshech Chochmah, takes a different approach to the breaking of the tablets. When Moshe sees the people dancing around the golden calf, he realizes that once he would bring them the tablets, they would start dancing around the tablets as they danced around the golden calf and would turn the tablets into another fetish. And that's why he broke them. We sit in the brokenness and ask ourselves, what are the fetishes and the golden calves we dance around? What are the false gods to which we give our ultimate allegiance, our utmost devotion, the idols we worship and serve, the demand we sacrifice everything, our time, our strength, our resources, our loved ones, our moral and spiritual values. Whatever that is, those fetishes we dance around, our love, our egos, our pleasure and comfort, our power, our money, our work, our addiction and, ide and ideology, all those relative and limited things which we turn into absolutes that end up taking over and ruling our lives. Yet another interpretation of the breaking of the first tablets, an astonishing Midrash, says that when Moshe started going down Mount Sinai with the tablets, the tablets carried their own weight, and even Moshe's weight with them. But when the tablets beheld the calf and the dancing, the writing, the letters on the tablets flew off, and the tablets became heavy in Moshe's hands. He was no longer able to carry them, so he cast them from his hands, and they were broken beneath the mountain. The words inscribed on the tablets made the tablets light. Without the words, the tablets were just pure stone. They became too heavy for Moshe to carry, and they fell and broke. Hasidic master the Svatimid adds the following. The engraving of the words of Torah in the tablets was dependent on their being engraved in the hearts of the people. Since the words were not inscribed in the hearts of the people, they were, not, they were also not firmly inscribed into the tablets, and they flew off. We sit in the brokenness, and we ask ourselves, what is really inscribed in our hearts? What do we authentically believe? What are the teachings and the values that guide us, the faith, by which we live. Now you may be curious, what ultimately happened with the broken pieces of the first tablets? Were they left behind? Were they discarded or buried in the wilderness? Rav Yosef teaches in the Talmud that the broken pieces of the first tablets were placed in the ark and carried together with the unbroken tablets. The Jewish tradition teaches us to honor the broken pieces, broken people, broken hearts, broken dreams, never to discard them or leave them behind, but to carry the fragments with us on our journeys as a permanent reminder and as a teacher. Because, yes, we sit in the brokenness with all the fragments and the shards of our hearts and of our lives, but we have so much to learn from those fragments a lot of opportunity to grow from those fragments. As the great, great poet, Leonard Cohen said, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your per perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light comes in. No cracks, no light. And so we sit in the brokenness and in the cracks in the fragments, in the shards, and we hope, we hope we can learn some lessons and let some light in. This is how the poet Roger Kamenetz talks about the broken tablets and the whole tablets. The broken tablets were also carried in the ark insofar as they represented everything shattered, everything lost, they were the law of broken things. 
the leaf torn from the stem in a storm, a cheek touched in fondness once, but now the name forgotten. How they must have rumbled, clattered on the way, even carried so carefully through the wasteland. How they must have rattled around until the pieces broke into pieces, the edges softened, crumbling, dust collected at the bottom of the ark, ghost of old letters, old laws, in so far as the law is broken, is still remembered. In so far as a law broken is still remembered, these laws were obeyed. And in so far as memory preserves the pattern of broken things, these bits of stone were preserved through many journeys and ruined days, even they say, into the promised land. And so may our broken pieces lead each one of us into light and into our promised lands. Now it is impossible to talk about brokenness without addressing the current situation in Israel. Israel has been in the news and in everyone's mind for the past few months and we, has, we have watched Israel struggle with the most significant internal crisis since its founding 75 years ago. Israel is breaking, and our hearts are breaking with it. 50 years ago today, on Yom Kippur, Israel faced one of the most severe threats of its existence, when it suffered a surprise attack by Egypt and Syria on the holiest day of the year. 50 years ago, on this day. It was a dire and deadly situation that lasted for almost three weeks. The very existence of the state was at stake. 2,700 Israelis lost their lives in the Yom Kippur War. Today, this Yom Kippur, Israel faces another terrible threat, and this time the threat is internal. Israel's democratic character is in grave danger, its social cohesion is in grave danger, its economy and national security as well. The establishment of the State of Israel is no doubt one of the greatest achievements of the Jewish people in the modern era and perhaps of all times. I don't think I need to remind us of the enormous privilege we have that generations of our people did not have for 2,000 years. We dare not, forget, dare not forget the bitterness of exile and the dire consequences of powerlessness over the centuries that culminated in the Shoah. We continue to celebrate the miracle of Israel's existence and its incredible accomplishments, many of them or most of them truly breathtaking. But while we have celebrated the miracle of Israel, we have avoided looking at the whole truth directly in the face. We have refused to see the broken pieces. We only wanted to see the wholeness. We have refused to see the ugly and the rotten. We only wanted to see the beautiful. We did not want to take into account the moral price that was paid and continues to be paid for the realization of the Jewish dream. We have made Israel blameless in our sight. We have become addicted to an image of perfection, and we have turned Israel into a fetish. Our love was blind love, and in the blindness we failed the Israel we love. And as we ignored the brokenness over the years, something ugly and morally corrupt kept expanding. Fascism, racism, Jewish supremacy and the glorification of the use of power and violence, religious extremism and messianism, the steady erosion of democracy and discrimination against the Arab-Palestinian minority, as well as the ongoing occupation and oppression of the Palestinian people and the denial of their basic rights. And even when we saw things that alarmed us, we were told to look away and to keep quiet, and most obeyed. 
Those who dared to speak up and challenge the official narrative were quickly silenced or marginalized as traitors. So what has recently erupted in the open has come to a shock, as a shock to many. Israel now is in the hands of the most extremist government in its history, a coalition that seeks to turn the country we love into a far-right theocratic dictatorship which threatens the rule of law, political dissent and a free press, the rights of women, LGBTQ people, Palestinians and other marginal group, marginalized groups, as well as liberal expressions of Judaism and religious pluralism. In addition, the cycle of deepening occupation, settlement expansion, and pseudo-annexation constitutes a threat for all Palestinians and Israelis. That's what we call a Jewish state. I am deeply worried for the future of Israel. I'm deeply worried for the future of the Jewish people in Israel, here, and in communities around the world. Because ultimately what happens in Israel will have an impact on us all. And the present governing co coalition befriending autocrats and anti-Semites will have an impact on us all. I am deeply worried about the future of Judaism and Jewish values and for the future of Torah, the Torah that is being used and manipulated to teach despicable and hateful things. At the same time, we have witnessed the most determined and sustained protest movement in Israel's history. Masses of Israelis of all ages and all walks of life have taken to the streets weekly for 38 weeks now. Jewish communities and organizations throughout our country have expressed deep concern for Israel's democratic future in solidarity with the protest movement in Israel. It is time to engage. If not now, when? We may not get another opportunity. We have an ongoing role to play by standing with, our, with, with, standing with and offering our support to the millions in Israel and here who are advocating for democracy, for civil and human rights, and who seek to ensure Israel's future as a free and democratic country. Democratic for all its inhabitants, not just for Jews. And who call to end the occupation once and for all. We have an ongoing role to play by standing with those who uphold the vision of Israel's Declaration of Independence, which reads, the State of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience and language, education and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions, and it will be faithful to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Several years ago, Susanna Heschel told a story about her father's great-great-grandfather, Rabbi Avraham Yoshua Heschel of Apt. He was an important Hasidic Rebbe in Poland, and many people would come to meet with him each day. They would tell him of their travels, seek his, seek his guidance, and ask him to pray on their behalf for refuah, the healing of a loved ones who was ill, for parnasa, financial sustenance, for shalom bayit, for peace in the family, or for finding a shiduch, for the right partner, to find the right partner for marriage, and so on. Someone asked him, Rebbe, so many people come every day, you get so many requests, how do you manage to remember each one of them in your prayers? You see, he answered, each time a person tells me about their troubles, my heart breaks. The next person comes in and it breaks even more. Then I stand in prayer and I tell God, God, 
Look at my heart. Look at all the fragments. Please help my people and bless them. And so I pray with all of us. God, look at our hearts. Look at all the fragments. Hear our prayers. Help us repent. Grant us your forgiveness. Heal us and make us and our world a bit more whole.